Right, good morning, everybody. Man, super, super excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Corey. Uh, I am the student life pastor around these parts, right? And so I get to uh, do all the fun stuff, like go into children's ministry. If you ever seen like a weird looking character in a costume walking around on a Sunday morning, it's probably me, because uh, I get to dress up in silly costumes and teach the kids about Jesus, which is like a super cool job, right? And then uh, I'm also the youth pastor on uh, Thursday nights. I get to uh, throw dodgeballs at kids and, again, teach them about Jesus. We have a lot of awesome youth leaders who are part of that. Super uh, exciting. By the way, if you're uh, youth group age, right, high school, middle school, uh, if, you're, uh, if you have kids who are high school, middle school, know somebody who's high school, middle school, this is your official invitation out to youth group on Thursdays. Uh, it's a super great time. Uh, and then I also uh, lead our young adults, like college age group, uh, and it's another awesome time, very family-centered time, and so if you're in the college age or young adult age, and I'll let you decide what that is, uh, you're welcome to also come out and uh, be a part of that, and at the very least, get some free food, which I think is pretty great. Uh, anyway, uh, that's a little bit about me and what I do here. Uh, we're going to continue in the book of Psalms this morning. Uh, Aaron started a uh, really awesome series last week called the Psalm Summer, Play uh, Psalm Summer Playlist. Try saying it five times fast, I dare you. Uh, but um, we're going to continue that series real quick. But do you mind if we pray real quick before we get into that? Do you mind? I've got the mic, so we're just going to do it, if that's cool. All right, uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for how you're at work in the life of uh, this church, how you're at work in the life of each and every individual here. Uh, God, I pray uh, that as we uh, turn into your word this morning, God, that you would speak to us in a way that only you can, God. Uh, open up our hearts and our eyes and our ears to, to see and hear and, and experience you in a different way this morning. God, there's, there's so many different walks of life that have come into this place this morning. So, so many people who are walking through uh, all sorts of trials, all sorts of difficult circumstances. God, I pray that you would speak to them this morning. I pray uh, that you would make yourself known to them this morning. Uh, God, don't let us leave here unchanged, but help us to leave here uh, knowing you just a little bit better, being a little bit more like you, being encouraged uh, by you. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, guys, so we're going to be in the book of Psalms this morning. Uh, and, and the Psalms are essentially like 150 uh, different poems that all express uh, different emotions that we as humans feel in relation to God. So uh, the, the Psalms is often called the heart of the Bible, and that's because you can open it up and it's like, the book that you get to right in the middle, but also because uh, there's a lot of different emotions displayed and expressed throughout this uh, book. So for example, you have uh, some Psalms that are all about love and adoration that we feel toward God. You have Psalms that are all about uh, us being full of sorrow due to our sin. Uh, we have uh, Psalms that are displaying uh, dependence in God through, uh, through difficult seasons of life. Um, the struggle between fear and trust, uh, walking with God uh, in really painful or dark circumstances, uh, thankfulness for God's care, and, and even devotion to God's word. These, these can all be found, and probably more than I'm missing, throughout the book of Psalms. And, uh, and here is what I think you can get out of Psalms, out of the book of Psalms, is that uh, from tearful laments to triumphant thanksgivings for God, uh, these are all expressions of emotions that serve uh, as sort of a pattern uh, to shape the emotions, to shape the actions of, of every believer. And so if you go and, and you read the book of Psalms, and I, I encourage you to do so, uh, I would venture to guess at least that you would probably uh, read a couple of Psalms and say, oh yeah, I've been there. Oh yeah, that speaks into a situation that I've been, been in. <clears throat> that speaks into a situation that maybe I'm in right now, right? And so that's, where, that's what all you can find in the book of Psalms. And, and last week, Aaron, uh, Pastor Aaron took us through Psalm 2, which points to Jesus as a triumphant king. 
And we're going to look at a different psalm this morning, Psalm 22. And this psalm uh, points to Jesus uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, And so Psalm 22 uh, is written by King David, and it's really a, like, sort of gut-wrenching psalm. If you read through it like we're going to in a little bit, you'll you'll really see uh, David is experiencing a sort of anguish uh, that he he describes really, really well, actually. And, And here's the thing, is that these emotions are not exclusive to David. Right? In fact, uh, the things that we're going to read in Psalm 22, uh, it points out one thing, is that uh, suffering, right, difficult circumstances, hard times, suffering is not uh, a thing that's exclusive to David, but suffering is a thing that every Christian has and or will face. Right? Suffering is something that every Christian, I'd, I'd even say every human, has faced or will face. And so uh, we, we, we understand this because we live in a broken world, a, a world that is uh, affected by sin in every way. And so we experience things like loneliness or, or loss or heartbreak or depression or financial burdens or uh, being stabbed in the back or an unsettling diagnosis. And, and I would say that we've all been there. I would even say that there's probably, in fact, I know that there are some who are here right now or even watching online who uh, are experiencing a suffering of their own uh, right now, even as you walked into this place this morning. And, and, and here's my hope for us this morning. Uh, I've got two. Uh, my hope for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ uh, our hope for those who, who have expressed that we are uh, Christians, that we trust in Jesus, my, my hope would be that uh, even when we are not okay, that we would know that Jesus is okay. Even when we're walking through a really hard, really difficult circumstances, we would know that God is still good. That's my hope for us as Christians, is that we'd be reaffirmed in our faith Uh, reaffirm that when we're suffering, when we're struggling, when trials come their way, when storms come their way, which they will, that uh, we will uh, be able to turn to God in those circumstances and know that he is still good. That's my hope for those of us who are Christians. Then I have a hope for those of us who uh, may not be Christians. Uh, And here's what it is, is that you would see that suffering is a very real thing that exists all around us and probably in your own life, my hope is that you would even turn and see where where God is working even in your own life, even right now, even amongst your unbelief. That's my hope this morning. And so uh, this morning, our uh, psalm is called It All Ends in Praise. And so if you've got your Bibles out, I really encourage you to uh, read your, uh, to pull out your Bible, turn to Psalm 22. And we're going to read the psalm as a whole. We're going to read the entire thing through. Uh, but I want us to notice two big things. I'm going to point them out uh, right now, even before we start. And here's what they are. Uh, I want you to notice these two things. The way the psalm begins and the way the psalm ends. And... Uh, so the way the psalm ends and the way the psalm, uh, the way the psalm begins and the way the psalm ends. Uh, psalm 22, verse 1. Uh, let's pray first and then we'll get into it. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray uh, just once more that uh, we will uh, turn to your word, God, that as we open up your word, you would speak to us in a way that only you can. Father, you know what we're struggling with, you know what we're going through, and, and, and you know that we need you. God, uh, reveal yourself to us this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, Psalm 22, verse 1, starts off with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, 
scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Don't be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They they pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him but has listened to his cry for help. For, from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This is God's word. This is Psalm 22. And And I want you to just notice that the way the psalm begins is not the way that the psalm ends. We're going to look at this psalm in in sort of three different parts. There's these uh, three particular words that I want you guys to remember. Uh, Maybe you'll go home and read Psalm 22. Maybe uh, later today, later this week, later this month, later this year, you'll remember Psalm 22. And I I hope that you might remember these three words uh, that'll help you just sort of uh, think through what's happening here. Here's the three words. Prayer, promise, and praise. Uh, let's look at prayer first, right? Because David starts the psalm off not with like your sort of typical like Sunday school appropriate kind of prayer. He starts the psalm off with a prayer that might make a lot of like really religious folks uncomfortable. Uh, he starts this prayer off uh, with this sort of honesty that, that maybe we don't always see and maybe we don't, e- don't even give in our own prayer life. Uh, You know, some people think that you have to be super articulate and well put together before you can come to God in prayer. Uh, David proves otherwise in this psalm. He starts off this psalm uh, not with uh, super articulate words, but by crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. That word forsake means to abandon. He's saying, God, why have you abandoned me? Like, where are you, God? Right? Where are you? He's saying, listen, enemies are surrounding me, and, and, my, and my body is in unimaginable pain, but notice that that's not where he starts. Notice that that is not the most crucial detail that's, that, that he's bringing up here. He starts off not with his enemies surrounding him, not with uh, uh, being in pain, but starting off by saying that it is the feeling that God isn't there that is tormenting me the most. He starts off with expressing how he feels like God has abandoned him, how he feels like God doesn't care about his suffering. And listen, 
This is not just the experience of David. I, I would venture to say that, <laughs> that, that this is the experience of all God's people and that uh, in our times of suffering, in our times of, of greatest need, that it's not the circumstances that are, that are causing our suffering that, that hurts the most, but sometimes feeling like God might not care. And listen, right, we can have all the right theology. We know that God cares about our sufferings, but sometimes it just doesn't feel like it. And that hurts. And this is the experience of all God's people in times of trouble. We wonder how God can just sit by when we're in times of suffering, when we're in times of distress. Uh, there's a few other places where he uh, goes through this. Uh, he says in verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Verse 11, uh, he says, Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. He says that uh, bulls surround him, and, and roaring lions are ready to open up their mouth and, and just destroy him and rip him to shreds, and that all of his bones are out of joint. And he, he's saying... God, I am, I am suffering, and it feels like you're not here. He's saying that I am suffering, and it feels like you don't care. And, and here's, here's point number one. In prayer, we don't have to come to God super put together, super articulate with our best foot forward. We, in fact, God already knows our circumstances, and so we can be brutally honest with God when we're hurting, when we're anxious, when we're lonely, when we're scared. Like, we can be brutally honest with God because God is already aware of your circumstances. He knows. He knows what you're facing. And so uh, that's number one, uh, prayer. The second word is promise, right? Uh, notice that David, <laughs> David never loses sight, never loses sight of who God is. Uh, he's in absolute despair. He's in pain. He feels far from God, but he never fully loses sight of who God is. In fact, uh, even the first words of the psalm, David reminds us all of who he is speaking to. He says, my God Right, that even in suffering, even in wondering about the ways of God, he, he doesn't stop believing in the existence of God. He doesn't stop believing in God's uh, 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 care, but he uh, does not let go of the knowledge of, that God is his God. He remembers God's past faithfulness or past promises fulfilled in Israel's history. If you look with me, verses 3 through 5 say, uh, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted in you and delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. So he remembers how God has been at work throughout the nation of Israel, throughout his people. But then he takes it a step farther, and he says, uh, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. So he remembers what God has done collectively as the nation of Israel, but then he takes it a step farther and he remembers what God has done right there in his own heart, right there in his own life, the ways that he has shaped and molded him into who it is uh, that, that he's becoming and, and the ways that he's been faithful to him. So many years ago, I was in this super dark place and uh, I, I, was, I was struggling with a sense of purpose. I felt like I was going nowhere in life. Uh, I was struggling with uh, like joblessness. I didn't have a job and, and, and it was really tough right now. And, and even when I got the job that I want, like got a job, it wasn't the job that I wanted. And so I still felt like low. Uh, I was uh, struggling with friends. I felt lonely. You know, I, I just felt like I didn't have anyone there. And I started to uh, doubt my purpose and, and doubt my God, right? If we can be honest about that, there's a good chance that many of us have been in a similar place. And, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to Pastor Scott about this, and, and here's what he said, and we're going on 10 years now, and I've not been able to get these words out of my head. Uh, he said, don't forget in murkiness 
what God has shown you in clarity. All right, don't forget in murkiness what God has shown you in clarity. Here's what I mean about that, is that it, it, in our life, for those of us as, as Christians, for those of us who are believers, we have seen firsthand how God has worked in our life. We've seen the things that he has uh, been faithful to us in, and we know that God has been faithful and, and that he will continue to be faithful. We, we know that God has been good and that he will continue to be good. And we can, we can even in the midst of suffering, like rest in the truth of who God is. And so our experience is different from David's like this. David looked forward to the promise that was given to him in anticipation we look back at the promise fulfilled through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Right? We, David was, was looking forward, knowing that God is good, knowing that God is faithful, and, and using all the, the past experiences to fuel that, that, that posture of worship in God. And we have the, the, the beautiful privilege to look back and seeing the promise fulfilled by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, Listen, I'm sure in this room, every single one of us could, could walk around and, and talk all day long about how God has been faithful to every single one of us, to how God has been good to every single one of us. We all have a story to tell, but none are more common than the gospel of Jesus. None are more common than the gospel of Jesus. You see, at, at sunlight, if you're unfamiliar, we talk about the gospel in three words, sin, salvation, and service. Now, the truth of the human condition is that we're all sinful, that we're all broken, we're all product of this broken world, and that God can't wrap his perfect arms around our brokenness, around our imperfection. And so uh, God has to punish sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so there has to be a punishment for sin, and God is totally just, so he is going to fulfill what he has said. But God is also the utmost of loving and the utmost of merciful, and so he sent Jesus uh, to, to live the life that we couldn't, die the death that we should have, and, and put him on the cross. And, and, and when he put him on the cross, God took our sins, took our shame, took our brokenness, and placed it on Jesus. And when Jesus died and rose again, it proved that our biggest enemy, sin and death, and the suffering of this world had been defeated, ultimately defeated at the cross. You see, Psalm 22 is very much about David and the, and the circumstances that he was facing in this life. And yes, it is very much about us and the circumstances that we face in this life. But ultimately, it points to Jesus and the circumstances that he volunteered himself for in his life for us. You see, Jesus just like David, had a crowd of people mocking him and ready to put him to death. Jesus, like David, <laughs> he, he, he had people casting lots for his clothing. I mean, go, go back and, and, and read Psalm 22 and then immediately read Matthew 27 and you will see the parallel in the last day of Jesus uh, with Psalm 22. In fact, Jesus even quotes Psalm 22 when he's on the cross. Now, when you're on the cross and dying, that seems like a weird time to like just flex those like scripture memory muscles, right? Like that seems like that seems like a, a weird thing to do. However, Jesus quotes Psalm 22 by saying, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" But what if he was doing more than, than just uh, just proclaiming the anguish that he had? What if he was doing more than just that? Let's read the rest of uh, Psalm 22 together. Uh, starting in verse 19, it says, You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. Uh, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of, of, of my praise in the great assembly. Before you, uh, before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. 
The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This psalm that, that begins in anguish and agony ends in victory. This psalm ends in praise. And, and listen, what if Jesus quoted the scripture not just because he embraced fully what David only was able to embrace uh, partially, but what if he quoted Psalm 22 not just for the anguish that he was currently in, but knowing that after a very short time, it was going to be victorious, that he was going to conquer sin and death for each one of us. What if he knew that what he was facing in the moment was painful and lonely, but he also knew that it was going to end in glory? <laughs> Romans 8.18 says that I am convinced that the suffering that we face now is nothing compared to the glory that we will see. Listen. There have been people in this room walking in week after week, even this morning. And, and, and we know that there are people in this room who are suffering. And sure, maybe it feels like we're supposed to walk in and people will be like, hey, how you doing? And you're like, fine, yeah, I'm good. The truth is, we don't have it all together. And if you have it all together, there's a good chance you're lying. <laughs> right? I, I, all of us in this, in this life experience trials and torment and, and pain and loneliness anxiety and loss and, and listen I know it hurts and, and and God knows it hurts and the truth is that that sometimes life really sucks I'm the youth pastor I can say that but I'm telling you that wherever you are in the psalm right now wherever you are suffering right now in the psalm it is not the end of the psalm it is going to end in praise I uh I posted last week in the Sunlight Family, and I asked people to uh, share a difficult circumstance that, that God has helped them get through. Can I read some of those? And, and we read the testimonies of, of our church family. Again, I've got a mic, so I'm just going to. One person said, my open heart surgery five years ago and all the unpleasant things that went along with it. Another person said, severe lupus that I fought with, the same thing that killed my mom when she was in her early 40s. Uh, my husband being unfaithful and walking out on me and my three children on, when I was on my deathbed and the death of my father and a kidney transplant. Uh, another person said a miscarriage. Another person said abuse and divorce. Uh, another person said breast cancer. Uh, someone else said deployment. One person said being told to just go home and get your affairs in order. And he says, look what God has done. Someone else said cancer, forgiving my brother's murderer, surgery, my child having cancer, uh, my son's depression and bipolar, and my daughter being sick, uh, being raped at 12, my mom and dad's divorce and family struggle with drugs. Uh, this person said joblessness, being so broke that I owed a few people a few thousand dollars and a complete loss of self-worth. He said he felt like he, he was Job in the Bible, but then he says, but I never lost faith and prayed every day. It was all part of God's plan. I was where I needed to be because of this and grown better than I was uh, and helped my family when they needed it most. And this person said, uh, being in a terrible marriage, but everything happens for a reason, part of God's plan. And through my old marriage, God was there and brought my husband of 30 years into my life. Uh, this person said uh, that she was, uh, her mom was diagnosed with a tumor in her pituitary gland, uh, but after the surgery, the doctors were able to identify that she'd had Parkinson's for years, and that was why she was in so much pain all that time. This person said, struggling with addictions, childhood trauma, the death of my own child, 
uh, uh, six years in hell because I no longer was going to be a victim. Uh, this person said through her uh, husband's liver transplant and, and through her son. Uh, this person said the death of our son at six months old on Christmas Day. Uh, this person said three failed pregnancies back to back, losing my mom suddenly from an aneurysm. She was only 48. Uh, being a drug addict and an alcoholic, the suicide of my brother, uh, 60 radiation treatments, he was there every time, divorce, miscarriage, and the majority of my close family members dying. There's only two left now. Uh, but one person said something that I thought was the most powerful, beautiful thing. If you don't know Miss Beverly, she's the sweetest human um, alive. And she said, sometimes I don't realize the pain and suffering that others have been through. May God bless each and every one who has left a comment. This has touched my heart, and I pray for peace for every one of us. In Christ, we stand. And there's more. I mean, you guys, God has been so good to our church family. And this is where I want to close. There's a, a poem that I read recently that I thought was really powerful that I think sums up our situation in this world. Uh, it's by a guy named Edward Shalito, and he was a minister and a soldier during World War I. And uh, he said that he uh, saw unspeakable things. He saw friends dying. He, saw, uh, he, he wasn't sure what his family was experiencing back home. He says this, uh, if we have never sought, we seek thee now. Thine eyes burn through the dark, our only stars. We must have sight of thorn pricks on thy brow. We must have thee, O Jesus, of the scars. The heavens frighten us. They are too calm. In all the universe, we have no place. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is the bomb? Lord Jesus, by thy scars, we claim thy grace. If when doors are shut, thou drawest near, only reveal those hands, that side of thine. We know today what wounds are, have no fear. Show us thy scars, we know the countersign. And this is my favorite part. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. Not a God has wounds, but our God alone. And it is through his wounds that, that we are rescued. It is through his wounds that we can be made clean. It is uh, because of his wounds that we can celebrate together. Thanks so much for viewing this sermon. I hope you enjoyed it. For more content like this, please subscribe below, and I'll see you next time.